Welcome everybody to the American Space Museum. I'm Mark Marquette and we're so glad you're with us today to stay curious with Gary Allgaier. Hey Gary. Hey, hi. Great Good to, to see you. you. Yeah. Great to have you back, Gary. Glad to be back. Gary's a structural engineer for NASA, 33 years. Gary, you explained to me that if it doesn't have electrons or fluid flowing through it, you know all about it. That's right. And he certainly does. And you're going to enjoy a, a program today where Gary's going to tell us about how the orbiters were built. And here's the fabulous orbiter there. I think that's Discovery with Eileen Collins at the helm there doing the flip around uh, 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 inspection there at the International the Space space Station. Yes. Yeah. Gorgeous view there, but you're going to see some pictures that you probably haven't seen before unless you stayed up late night Googling images of the shuttle everywhere because Gary's done that and he's put together a little program here for us that we're celebrating uh, uh, in the month of March, celebrating those shuttles that flew in the month of March. Uh, we've detailed a few of them this month and we'll talk about some of them as we go through the month of March. Okay. Also wanted to let you know we haven't forgotten March is women's month and we'll be highlighting women of the space age and the three leaders of nasa's main centers are women and we're going to highlight them one day on stay curious so tell your friends to watch us on youtube and facebook uh, you're going to see some interest in programming there and gary you know what we're all about for over 20 years we've been preserving the birth of the american That's space right. age here in this delivery room for bard county yeah. And, and you, my friend, are what we call national treasures. Yes. You did things that were, didn't translate. Marty Winkle, our camera, my former cameraman, sure. co-producer. Uh, Marty's also uh, a, a national treasure. And that's why you folks out there that watch Stay Curious are attracted to this, because you're hearing from people like Gary that walked around all these orbiters and, and uh, uh, they were connected to you in a way yeah, like, just, like cars are to people in your, your own correct. yard right and not only do we walk around i've crawled around inside that thing everywhere there can be in the shuttle i've been inside the wings the crew compartment the aft so it, if it was there i was i was on it or doing something with it now you weren't allowed to take your own pictures unfortunately no. uh there they had staff photographers for nasa That's there correct. but and some of those pictures are really hard to find aren't they they are they're very hard i have some in my personal collection that i collected over the years mm -hmm. that we that they would hand to us that we could take home uh after we left the, uh nasa well let's get off on this program of learning some things about the mighty shuttle mm -hmm. there taken off tom usiak took that photograph of discovery and uh of course john glenn's on that one that's sts 95 there oh, okay with uh kurt brown the commander of that flight of seven people going up there and uh that was 1995 i believe right that's correct in there so but uh gary take it away here's a okay. little schematic of some of the pieces parts gary's got a little pointer that we think shows well, it, up on it, the green we found out it doesn't work on the on when it, we get to that part they, oh, won't, they okay. won't show up so unfortunately we can't all do right. that well marty might have to get his pointer yeah. going out there because he's familiar with the orbiter also so take it away gary okay when nasa uh sent out the proposal to have a shuttle built all your major aer uh, aerospace companies uh competed in the competition to win the the uh, the, con the contract to build a shuttle Rockwell uh, came on board and said that uh, we will build a shuttle, and they had a concept, but one of the things we will do is we'll subcontract out all the major parts to all these other contractors that lost the contract. Hmm. So that's what's happened here is this is a breakdown of who built what and where. Now, the SRBs were what, what Rocketdyne, uh, and then the tank was done by Lockheed Martin. The SRBs were in Utah. I yeah, know Utah. That. And Mar uh, Marshall was in responsible for all that, and they did also built the tank. As far as the shuttle, that was under the auspice of uh, Houston, uh, JSC out there at uh, in Texas. And Rockwell was the company that built it, and they had a manufacturing facility in Palmdale, uh, California. And so all these uh, breakdown is that uh, I'll go through that. Um, the wings were being built by Grumman and, and Bethpage, New York. Uh, 
Hmm. The mid-body was built by General Dynamics. The payload bay doors, the forward crew compartment, and the aft crew, uh, compartment were built by Rockwell itself. The door payload bay doors were built by Rockwell, but that was their Tulsa division that did that. Uh, leading edges, let me get this, make sure I can get this right, was built by... Well, the, the uh, we were talking about earlier, all over America, yeah. Yes. Uh, almost you said all 50 states had something to do something with building to do with the orbiter. It. Yeah, McDonnell Douglas, uh, your, all your major airframe companies had at some part in, or into the uh, building of the, the shuttle. All those components were sent to Palmdale, California, and Rockwell had a, a, a two bays where they could assemble two sh simultaneously. Yeah, we'll shuttles. see those in a minute. In here. a minute, okay. Yeah. Um, well, we wanted to mention, as we see here, the uh, uh, Enterprise being ferried. Uh, you're going you're to describe the uh, the little uh, unicorn, the nose on the <laughs> nose, front there. Yes. As, as I mentioned here, that. We looked up, Gary and I did, a planetary society did a uh, nice article years ago on the cost of the first orbiter, all right, from 1972 when it was okayed by the Nixon administration to 1981 when it orbited during the Reagan administration. And they calculate in 2020 dollars that the first orbiter, Columbia, cost $48 billion from development wow. to landing out there. Uh, and the orbiters themselves, uh, after that, were over $2 billion each, which you mentioned that cost $4 billion for the Artemis uncrewed launch, Artemis 1. Yes, that had right. been two orbiters. That's hmm. correct. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good exchange. <laughs> Gary, but uh, historic uh, this... alt tests there, approach and landing tests of the, yeah. of, uh, the, out there at the desert of Southwest. Yeah, this was the first uh, drop test with the uh, uh, astronauts inside. On uh, this is Enterprise, and it has the tail cone on it, which is built by Boeing in Seattle, I said Washington. Denver, I think. I'm sorry. Pardon? Inter I meant Enterprise. Yeah, it's Enterprise. And this is a part, This is the first drop test, and there was a lot of discussion how that would work. There were, a lot of people were saying that it wouldn't work. How are they going to get the two to separate? And they just flew away from each other, and then they did their test. And the little spike out there, all the airplanes that are under development uh, phase have one of those spikes. And it, what they have out there is their air data uh, probe and an angle of attack. So mm -hmm. there, it's in clean air. So uh, the the structure sticking out yeah. from the nose there. And what it does is at the we have X we use X Y and Z coordinates to find everything in the orbiter we want to do. But the X sub zero, the very end point, starts at that tip of that probe, mm -hmm. and then we work our way back. But after we get it, after the development test. Uh, Columbia never had one of those on it. It was just an enterprise that had that. Okay. So, and then we did drop tests without the tail cone at the end. And then uh, next thing we know, we had a Columbia was built, was delivered to us. Well, we've got a lot of slides yeah. to show you yes. because it's important to, to have fun and also get Gary here because he's a snowbird and he's going back up to <laughs> his cabin in Georgia here in a month or so. So we're going to miss you, but uh, he's promised that when he is down here this fall, and throughout the winter, he'll be wanting to help us here at the museum like he does as a docent yep. and on Stay Curious. So, uh, Gary, let's, uh, but this is a rare one. I love this photo. Okay, this is this could be Enterprise or it could be Columbia uh, in Palmdale. This is the first part of the construction. You can see the wings have been, are being ready to be mated to the fuselage. And then there's nothing in it but just the ribs from the mid-body bay. And the, and the aft bulkheads, and that's that's what we got here. What's the material? It's all aluminum. Aluminum, aircraft, okay. Air, aircraft grade aluminum. Okay. And uh, it's just typical aircraft in construction. All right. And this here is a picture of, it, it could be, again, could be Columbia or it could be Enterprise. This is what we call the crew compartment. It's the inner part uh, of the forward fuselage. So this would be the pressurized. So this is the pressurized compartment, of. and we, as in, as uh, we started doing compared to Apollo, Apollo we flew with a, 
at 5 psi cabin pressure. Here we're flying at uh, standard atmosphere 14.7 psi. Now the first four shuttles had a special two-man only feature. That's correct. Yes. And uh, we had injection seats for the uh, commander and for the shuttle pilot. And uh, here we have a picture of here. Here's one. Here's the real one here. It's in Columbia. And you can see how large they are. They took up a lot of area. So people ask why didn't all the astronauts have ejection seats? And there just, just wasn't enough room to, to do that, uh, especially for the ones that are in the list in the lower deck for launch and there was no there would actually be no way for them to eject out you're going to see a cool lower yeah. deck shot and this was a whole risky thing maybe yes. fingers crossed that john young yeah. uh, would take a uh, uh, uh marty you remember what john young said about the ejection seats uh and the survivability of it yeah i think it was him who said if uh, if everybody doesn't have an ejection seat we will have an ejection seat that's uh, true for any aircraft. Effect. All right. All aircraft are that way. John Young yeah. also said the survivability of it yes. would be uh, contingent upon uh, uh, several miracles followed by yes. the success yeah. of or something. That's what I was asking you about. That was RTLS. Yeah. Well, okay. That was in reference to RTLS. Okay. okay. He said about the same thing about the ejection seats, too. It, basically. That, yeah. uh, he thought they'd be fried by the SRBs. I don't, they passed on I don't know if they could actually eject on the ascent until after the SRBs. Uh, there was a turnaround procedure if, yeah, if, the, uh, there, if the engines failed and, and they could had enough energy where they could fly back and return to the landing site. And basically, you'd have to be almost sub subsonic to mm -hmm. eject out of the uh, shuttle. So that would be on reentry, basically. But they did have training to get out of it yes. if they could at controlled air speeds or uh, if it landed in water or some water. And this is just a depiction of the different scenarios. If it landed and uh, they didn't use the ejection seats, they could pop the two panels off alpha to top. And they could slide down. They had a, a little blanket that they could slide over, and then a cable case system that lowered them to the ground. So this just shows that sequence. And fortunately, I mean, luckily, we never had to do that. And now this and then, this is a picture after after Challenger. They decided we do need a, some type of a way to have the crew safely eject from the shuttle if it's flying back in and there's an there is a problem and they're not going to be able to land. And this, again, you have to, I think, have to be subsonic to do mm -hmm. that. And there was a pole that they slid down. This is to get them away from the wing because if they didn't have it and they jumped out the hatch, they would hex, they would hit the wing, and that would not Ooh. be a good thing. So that, that's what they, uh, they uh, slid down. And they had parachutes for every person on board uh, uh, positioned up on one of the uh, ceiling of the, and the aft flight deck mm -hmm. or the bottom, yeah, crew compartment. Well, back to the nuts and bolts of building these beautiful uh, birds that, uh, uh, you know, the most flown was Discovery 39 times, of course, 10 times yeah. by uh, Challenger. And what are we looking at here, Gary? Now, this is again back at Palmdale. Uh, you can see the payload bay doors have been installed. There are graphite epoxy doors, and they have aluminum frameworks to, to, for the structural integrity of the, of the door. You see a little bit more built up in the payload bay area. The bay is divided into 13 different sections. Uh, they're all they're not of equal length between the bays because they uh, they decided that uh, the heavy payloads would fly in the aft, and the lighter payloads would fly in the in the, towards the nose, and they didn't need the structural uh, rigidity for a lighter payload up up payload up front, so they could space the uh, to make it more efficient and and save weight, they just built the bays what what, what was needed for that particular area. So, okay, and uh, now we're again the cabin forward end of this it. This is there. another you know they, this is the next stage as they're starting to build up, and this is the the pressure module has been inserted into the bottom half of the forward fuselage. What's the gold covering there? That's just blanket insulation for thermal protection. Mm -hmm. uh, so the windows have been put in? Put in the window, yes. All right. And then again, here's another one. This is Endeavor. 
Uh, it's a little bit more fidelity. It has more blankets on it, and they're getting ready to lower it down into the uh, Ford fuselage in Palmdale. Now, this is an unusual picture. Yes. Two orbiters yeah. in this photo. And Atlantis is on the left, and Columbia is on the right. This Columbia was sent back to Palmdale after the uh, ALT test and after we... I forget how many launches we did here where they finally decided we're going to, it's, it's, it's a, mm -hmm. it's, uh, I forget the terminology for it, but, it, uh, it wasn't in a, an experimental development stage anymore. And what they're doing here is they're taking the, all the injection seat system out to save weight and any of the weight that they can take out besides the ejection seat was, <clears throat> there was a pallet in the aft of the payload bay that had all kinds of instrumentation that measured all these different parameters during the development uh, testing. Yeah, it looks like Columbia, according to my shuttle scroll here, Gary, uh, they flew six missions with the uh, Space Mission, Lab, yeah. one Young's last mission, STS-9, yeah. and then it returned to flight like, uh, in uh, 86, January 86, uh, that's right. Columbia's uh, SATCOM Air for 61C, yeah. Yeah, that's right. It, yeah, it returned to flight yeah. for one mission right before Columbia there. Right. In, in now, the, the Columbia was always the heaviest shuttle. It uh, it could never fly to the space station, so it was regulated to uh, just flying the regular orbital missions. And, in fact, it couldn't service the space telescope either because it was just had not have enough. It was too heavy to get to that altitude. Mm -hmm. Now, what part is this? Now, this is the uh, the forward RCS compart uh, uh, compartment, I guess we can call it that. Uh, oh, in the module, nose. It's in the, the nose. Uh, has been, okay, has, so that's has the nose been, I see the right there. Yeah. My head here is right It there. has it's been it. taken. It's been removed. Uh, and then what you see right uh, there, well, it doesn't work out too good. <laughs> yeah. uh, you can see the, uh, the, the, the box where the yeah, nose landing gear, yeah, that right there, that's where the nose landing gear is up inside that. That's just the cover over it. And then the rest of it is uh, the forward RCS uh, module. Reaction and control, control system. And they take it off system. to service it uh, occasionally when in there in the OPF. Hmm. I have to have that beside. This yeah. is another unusual angle that you don't yeah. see much of now wide this, angle this is one of the later uh versions you know pictures taken of the at the bottom flight deck or the main deck rather and um, there's ladders on each side that's how you can climb up in here when we're on the ground we can climb up to the upper deck and have access to the flight deck and the aft flight deck um, behind that ladder on the right, that is where the bathroom was. So the hatch goes to? The hatch goes into the payload bay. Okay, so we're looking out the back at of the, back, the shuttle. Yeah. The bathroom, Marty, is like where I'm trying to point. It's right It's it's right, right there behind the ladder. Yeah, in the corner. The the there, yeah, everyone right wants there. to know where the loo is. Yeah, the, that's where it's the at, water right, closet. Yeah, that's where it is right there. Okay. And the tube coming through the hatch is just providing air for, uh, uh, for everybody that's working in it, we just need to get air circulating through there. And then... Uh, I, I heard, we heard an astronaut, uh, Guy Gardner, Marty, I think, described the bathroom as uh, an outhouse with a vacuum cleaner attachment. <laughs> and during the first Columbia mission, the, the, uh, they have a fan in there that's pulling a, a vacuum. Uh -huh. And the, somehow the... the uh, fan went backwards oh no and completely took everything that was in there and flung it out into the uh, crew compartment and when we when it got back to kennedy uh we had some of the people had to go in there and wipe down everything oh my gosh and, i'm uh, telling you that was heard one of, some the, of those stories yeah, yeah. that was yeah, like, well, all right. We're, we're okay. busy along here with Gary Allgaier. Okay. When he showed me this picture, I'm going, wow, okay. that's where you sit in the lower, lower mid deck, deck, mid -deck. To, to ride to space. I mean, uh, there's nothing to look at. There's <laughs> nothing to look at. The only thing they have is uh, where the at, uh, air duct is coming through. When they close the hatch, there's a small window. So that's about only visibility they have to the outside. So you're part riding basically in a... In a cave, you don't get to see anything, so it's uh, 
kind of weird that you wouldn't have any visual clues as you're as you're going into the orbit or coming back through the atmosphere for landing. Yeah, never heard an astronaut really comment about that. Yes. Have you, Marty, where they've said any? Uh, we've talked to several of them. Of course, have been lower. Bay, and usually they're busy doing something. I think uh, they could be, uh, uh, and and they're they're usually the one that when uh, they go weightless, they have the cameras to go around and take pictures yeah. up in the now the wall the mid deck the wall in I front mean, of them is where there's all those are individual panels that remove, and that's where all the computers and all the electronics are at for the shuttle. Well, there's enough room there for a flat screen and yeah. uh, pipe in NASA TV so you could watch your own launch. Well, right? when they have a seven man crew, there's actually another row of, uh, in front of that, and that has their sleep stations in it. Wow. Good picture there. Okay. Uh, never seen that yeah. one. And here's the. Here's the flight deck. Uh, this is the electronic uh, glass cockpit, we called it, where all the mechanical instrumentation has been removed and we were using computer screens to uh and the commander uh they use right there of course commander is always on the left and yes. pilot on the right uh and the the commander is the pilot they never it's, say co-pilot and it's pilot. Right. Yes. i mean the commander's flying the thing they just never wanted to use that uh, that's right because one you had to have a commander yeah on board there and then the, uh were the of course uh uh these tail numbers of the uh, and then, of course, OV-103 was the best glass cockpit. I think I'm almost positive that they all had, uh, they were, none of them had glass cockpits. And I know, I think one or two were sent back, and then they didn't install the glass cockpits. But mm -hmm. I, I, I wouldn't. And Deborah was definitely built with one because yeah, yeah. it was a replacement of Challenger was okay. later. And OV-99, the, the Challenger, really was never intended at the beginning to fly. Mm-hmm. And it was we call Iron Maiden. All aircraft have an Iron Maiden where they do all the structural testing of the orb of that fits plane or the orbiter to verify the structural integrity. They'll bend the wings up, force it up, and they'll you know, and it's subject to a lot of things that uh, the, the flight units will never subject to. And then after uh, they decided that they wanted to see if they you get another sh extra shuttle. So there was a competition or thought about taking Enterprise and make it flight worthy or taking the uh, OV-99, which was a uh, challenger to make it one. Fortunately, they didn't they didn't take the structural testing to failure. In a lot of places, you know, airplanes, they do that. They'll take it to failure. That's what and, an Iron Maiden is, huh? Yeah, that's what an Iron Maiden is. Uh, do you have and, any of the uh, albums? No, no, no. <laughs> the no. rock band Iron yeah. Maiden. And I did have the opportunity uh, to go out to California, and I spent 30 nights working third shift when they did the acoustic vibration testing of OV 99, uh -huh. and they would do that. And uh, what was that like? Well, for me, it was it was kind of boring. I just sat in front of a console. And uh, the thing was that the Rockwell engineers didn't have the expertise that they needed to do that test. So they, <laughs> they brought in Lockheed, which was down the street building some airplanes. So they brought those people in to do hmm. the actual testing. I'd go out there and look at it, and you really couldn't tell much. They were vibrating, but you just, you just didn't see anything. But they were taking all kinds of measurements hmm. to uh, verify uh, a lot. of. They had to find the natural... Uh, frequency of the orbiter and then everything is based on when it's built it doesn't meet the same frequency natural harmonic frequency that the shuttle has and uh, there's a case where uh, for the active uh, latches that are for the payload where the engineer designed it he was given a certain volume and you know he knew what kind of loads he was going to have he built he designed it and they did a prototype he turned it over to the acoustic people and vibration people and they came back and told him that he had to do something different because its natural harmonic frequency was at the same as a shuttle and once they meet if they're both at the same one they will destroy each other really so he Who had thought to, about that he, harmonics yeah he had to change he had deal. to he had to change either a shape or a change of material so he just trimmed here trimmed there and that met met the requirements interesting we'll yeah. talk more about that one day yeah. with structural engineer here gary allgaier that's something i never thought about the harmonics yeah. <laughs> wave going through metal yeah. and so forth uh creating uh disturbances in there we got a question marty you yeah, have a question, question i'm trying to understand
trying to read its name and make it wrong. Stamps to come better. Anyway, was Columbia a little heavier than the other orbiters? Kind of. Was that? That's the question. Was Columbia the heaviest yes. of the orbit? Yes, Columbia was was heavier. We never could go in there and remove all the instrumentation that was buried deep into the inside the the vehicle. So it was always heavier. Plus, we had the uh, on the top of, on the vertical stabilizer. We put the camera up there that we'll sort of have a picture. Yeah, of. we'll see a picture of that. So, it had extra instrumentation. And, and, yes, because it was the first. And, and it, it we'll get to. Uh, let's see here. Yeah. When we get to. Uh, uh, let's let's see. Yeah, let's go down a little bit. There we go. Good question there. Thank you. Yes, it okay. was the heaviest. In fact, when Bob Crippen gave kind of the eulogy of uh, uh, who was, of course, the pilot with uh, uh, John Young, he said that, you know, she's a little heavy in the bottom. That's I remember right. him saying up well, there. Well, but she was a beautiful spaceship. We had to go back. We had to do another mod when it got to, to the uh, Cape. Is that in the bottom of the between the stringers that runs the whole length of the payload bay? We had to come back in there and coat it with our TV, uh, and I'll show you. You'll see that yeah. in one of the other pictures. But the, the reason they did that is they were still kind of concerned about a tile on the on the on the bottom being lost and heat coming through. And this was the slow that heat burned through into the through the aluminum. So uh, I don't know if the, all the other shuttles had that, but I know we had to go back in and put it. And that stuff, you know, as, it, as you add it in there, it's going to increase the weight. Mm -hmm. So they never could take that out. So they had some sort of heat shield in Columbia that the other yes. ones didn't have yes. to add weight to it. There. This Great question. Does. This is a phenomenal picture that you're not going to see many places there. That's... Uh, what there's a shuttle well, in when you there walk, somewhere, when you walk right? Into the, you, <laughs> this is when OPF. you walk into the OPF Bay, and you sit and you look at up that structure, there is a shuttle in there somewhere. Wow! And you just it, we just built up so much equipment around there and testing equipment and everything, so I mean you just couldn't see it. That's amazing. Yeah. Our good friend Terry White, who's on tomorrow, yeah. we'll be talking. I'll be showing yeah. Terry that picture maybe too as we yeah. go in there. Now, uh, here's the orbiter coming into the orbital processing facility, the three garages it was built. But call your attention to the man with the flashlight. Now, yes, there's a, there's three lines that he's walking on, and two of them are, are to match, match up with the nose landing gear. But in between the two, because the, they're as wide as the tires are wide, but the one in between the middle of them is a little about a, I guess it's an inch wide line. That's right here. It's very hard to pick up in this picture. We unless we could blow it up a little bit more. Marty, there's a stick actually in front yeah. there. that has yeah. got a wheel on it. Yes. Right there at the bottom. Yep. Keep left. Keep going. Right, right there. there yep. Right there. Yep. Right there is so a little So precise you guys stick. are. There's a little stick comes down. It's got two little wheels on it. And what they're trying to do is line up that little pointer in the middle of that stick to that little thin line. So they want to precisely locate the arbiter in the in the uh, OPF so that we can attach the jacks and lift it up and all the platforms will match up in exactly where they should be with the arbiter. A hundred ton orbiter, yeah. right? It was 174,000 pounds. Oh, wow. I think it's an arbiter with no, no payload in it before, before launch. Uh, that is a lot there, and you guys are so precise, and uh, just uh, I can hear the tires creaking against them <laughs> polished floors. But the guy there. with the flashlight is help, helping, pointing, telling the, get the driver which way to go in and out, you know, to left or right, to make sure he's on that line when they come in. Because in that little orange vehicle, there's a guy sitting in there, right? Yeah, there's the a, controls yeah. squashed in there somewhere. Yes. All right. All right, good. Or we're enjoying uh, seeing some things as I go backwards to see things we just saw. Uh, now, this is the, the, nose, the nose. This is the nose wheel landing gear. Modesco was the manufacturer of the gear. The, the main it's complicated up there. It is saying. the main gear tires are off of a B one B bomber. The nose wheel tires, I'm not sure where they what are, what they're off of, but the we hydro. Got a question? Yeah, go ahead, Marty, with yeah. a question there. Okay, so question again from Tamsin Come Bannon. Flight Director Jay Green talked about a shuttle prototype called Messiah. 
Was that the same vehicle which was later named Enterprise? Uh, I know there was a, a uh, petition or survey to name it Enterprise because of Star Trek. And that was our, our uh, it's, mm -hmm. it was a nationwide survey that says that's what we want. Messiah is another shuttle he's saying, Marty? It may or have the, been. I, I think he's asking was Enterprise, Enterprise initially called Messiah. Oh, okay. I've, I've never heard that. As being called Messiah, all we knew it was, uh, I forget the tail number, I mean, but I don't even know what the tail number was, but we never, I never heard that mention. 101, yeah, 101 then. I never heard the uh, Messiah. I really, I really, there is no 100. I think it is 101. 101. I really can't confirm that or deny it. give us something know. to stay curious yeah, about and yeah. look it up. Thanks for your okay. question there. All right. But the, for the nose wheel, uh, what? We hydraulically raise the gears, both the mains and the nose gear. It's hydraulically retracted, but it's a gravity dropped. Uh, <laughs> There's your when we open the doors. Can we go back to the other one, Herman? Okay. And what it, how that works is that the nose wheel and the main wheel are tied into the landing gear door. So there's two yokes up at the top. Can you point that out, Marty? Here we go. Keep going up, go up, go up. Hey, almost there, almost there, right there. Anyway, they they when the gear comes up, they go they clamp around the and it pulls the doors closed. Now, the aerodynamics people were concerned about the the nose wheel coming back down because of gravity drop, and they didn't think there was enough weight in the wheels to open it up if there's a, a 200 miles an hour plus the airflow over the doors would keep them from opening so right above that there is a little rod it's a, it's a spring loaded thing so what they did was they used a spring to push the door push the landing gear start the initial uh extension and that pushed the the the, the gear down and once it got going then they would know that it would automatically drop Okay. And so when we retract, when we retract the wheel, that's what the next picture yeah. is, is that you'll see that they have to push on the doors. And what they're doing is they're compressing against that plunger that's trying to push the doors open. So they had to, every time they uh, raised the nose wheel uh, hydraulically, they still had to go push the uh, doors closed. Well, we're built, and that's a cool picture there of, uh, you know, that's the way they had to do it. You yeah. get the broom crew out there, uh, and, uh, you know, one minute you're inside a wing or or looking at wiring. Next thing you're grabbing a, a mop head and closing and the window, window closing the, the doors. The, the yeah. doors. Love this picture. Never seen this before. I had to ask, what are we looking at here? Yeah. What part of the shuttle? This is Front, the, back? What are we looking at here, this is the This is the very aft. The uh, heat shield around the in, uh, upper engine has been removed. And so, so you have this big engines hole. engines go in there. Three it's, engines in that hole. Well, well, only one engine in that hole. There's oh, okay. three holes. Oh, gotcha. Okay. There's, okay. there's only one. So, But anyway, the engine is out. And you can see into the aft light. Uh, fuselage and it's very very uh, compact there's a lot of big uh, fuel lines uh, hydraulic lines uh, you name it it's in there and uh, we have to have platforms in it for, for when we're horizontal plus we have a different set of platforms when we're vertical and that's the vertical stabilizer marty and if you show up at the top there that's the cover of the parachute that pops out yes that we have uh, one of those uh, space flown covers in our yes. museum there that's right a little square up there i love pointing that out at atlantis when we go out there and see see her out okay. there at kenny visitors complex thank you marty uh some pipes this is a picture of in, of inside the uh, aft fuselage you can see the fuel lines uh, so what diameter? I think it, there's seven inches. There are right? seven or, or, or inches greater, or even greater. We have a question, question Marty. Yeah, yeah, Gary Charles asking: Were all the OPFs built, built the same? For all the OPFs, yes. oil processing facilities, the shuttle garage. Basically, they're all the same. There is a 
if you like in housing there's a left right uh, hand version there's a right hand version which is this mirror flipped over and OPFB one and two are just mirror images of each other uh, we use OPFB one the most uh, that's where the first shot you know, Columbia went in and uh, one of the interesting things when we just start first start talking about processing in the OPF the question that was presented to us, should the shuttle be pulled in or should it be backed in? Hmm. And that went on for weeks. Really? One day we're going to pull it in. One day we're going to back it in. Front first or back first? Or back it in. And finally, the engineer was in our office that was responsible for really making the final decision. He just kept, he couldn't make up his mind. Finally, design engineering says, we're doing it. We've already made a decision. We're going to pull it in, which was the right decision. <laughs> Forward. Yeah. A month debate over. It, like, was. it was. Yeah. <laughs> one day we're going to pull it in. The next day we'd come back and say, oh, we're going to back it. And that's what he was. He was he was having a hard time. He'd go out and talk to the airline industries, go to the bases, and he never could get a definitive answer. Huh. So I guess those would be the right people to talk to, though. Yeah. I yeah. like that approach there. Yeah. The, the powerful engines, SSMEs. Uh, there is the fuel lines uh, for the uh, the ingredients there. Uh, uh, these are pretty big too. And they have a red. It's, it's red protective cover to protect this particular one from people banging into it and, mm -hmm. and damaging it. Lots of covers and things in there. There, I chose this picture. This is uh, they're in, well, they could be installing it to be removing it. To the guy but, on top yeah. of that SME. Yeah, he, yeah, he's got a, just kind of rides it in there and guides it in. And they have this big machine that would bring them over from the... Originally, they used to have the workshop for the engines was in the VAB low bay area. Mm -hmm. and then eventually, they built their own facility. But then they uh, they would bring them over, install them, or remove them. They did this for every every mission. Got a couple of workers on the bottom there yeah. uh, 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 watching. Uh, you know, I got four or five people watch one guy work. Yeah. Uh, there's two people inside. Uh, right there. The yeah. hole there. Yeah. Uh, what what what's the order numbers? Uh, what uh, what would that engine be? Technically, one, two, two, three. How how do they call? You them? need to talk to a main engine person. I'm not. Okay. <laughs> I, All right. Like I said, it it happens has a fluid through it or. There, yeah, there you yeah, go. I, yeah, fluids I, going I, through yeah, that. I, I really don't know which one. Well, we're, we're enjoying Gary Allgaier, structural engineer, giving us behind the scenes of building the shuttles. You know what this piece part is when he tells you. This this is the Ohm's pod. And it took a special fixture. Oh, OM's pod. Tell yeah. what that acronym Orbital is. maneuvering system. Orbital maneuvering system. This is on the, in the aft. There's one on each side. They're mirror images of each other. And they had a special rig that uh, took them a while to figure out how to do it, remove it, because it's not totally vertically. It's uh, They go on like at, a, at an angle. And so it was complicated to uh, come up with that. Yes. Question, Marty? On our UCAC family mm -hmm. microphone there. Yeah, trams that come back banging. Uh, were the Ohm's engines developed by Rock Die 2 or by Rockwell? Oh, uh, I think so. Mm. Uh, I, I, I really couldn't tell you to that. Mm, I'm stumped too. Yeah. I would like to say yes, but yes. as they divide the pie to other people, people that yes. might be something. I don't know who, who, who else uh, would do it. You know, I never did know. You know, I, they, I know they're there. But it wasn't my system. Well, we'll look that up. So we'd because, have to look that up. You know, Unfortunately, I wish every I one of these the systems answer. is a program to have. I want yeah. to do a program with Gary when you come back this fall uh, on the doors. We've been the talking doors. about the doors, and we're yeah. fascinated about the doors, but we're not going to get into that. Yeah. Here, here's here's the uh, uh, the OM's pod, which are those two humps on either the side of the, the vertical stabilizer rudder on the back, and never seen the back side of them. Oh. And you're still not going to. Here we are. Wow. Here's, here's that's, your that's a fuel tank. So. You have your oxidizer tank and your fuel tank, and then the route ones would be the GN2 to pressurize the tanks uh, for maneuverability to keep the, the fuel pushed towards the mm -hmm. uh, the engine. And these are what slow the shuttle down to bring it back to Earth for reentry. Yeah. Wow. Now we're going to talk about 260 plus miles of wiring, thousands of connectors. Ten thousands of, of fasteners. Got a question? Yes, question there. No answer. <laughs> oh. oh, someone knows out there. Let me guess. Oh, okay. Uh, Tom, uh, Mark Usiak knows and looked up. Oh, you do, Marty. Go ahead, buddy. 
I did. Oh, okay. <laughs> Aerojet developed the Aerojet. Engine. Okay, yeah, that's true. Aerojet okay. developed the uh, the RCS engines. The, okay. All right. This Great. is thanks, Marty. If you if you ever see a, a, the Atlantis and you look at it, you won't see this because it's closed out with blanket, blankets between the frameworks that forms up the payload bay. And this shows what's underneath those blankets and also the wire trays. Now, the wire tray is divided into three compartments that run the full length of the payload bay. The upper and the lower uh, wire trays are dedicated to the orbiter and those never get changed out. The center section, which is blank right now, does not have anything in it, but that is dedicated to the individual's payloads that fly on the orbiter. Hmm. So for every mission, as after we lands and we turn it around, we open up the covers on, a, on that particular tray and remove the wiring or hydraulic lines or whatever lines that water lines that are going to that particular payload that was flown and take them out and then we come in with a new kit with all the new wiring and whatever uh, fluid lines that need to be installed hmm. and here's another area yeah, yeah this this shows the uh, with the stringers uh, and you can see the reddish material that is the thermal stuff we put down on there to protect the, for burn through the very bottom there the very the red bottom kind of clay okay. looking and then you you, you see the uh, these are fluid lines that have been insulated but you can just see all the stuff that's down below that and we cannot walk on any of that because you're just going to destroy something so we have to bring in platforms that go from frame to frame, and then we can build up from that. We'll see those a little later, but that's how we had to work. We couldn't touch anything, and this strut that you see, that gray strut you see going at a vertical, mm -hmm. that's it's a cover. We used what they spent, what they called boron aluminum uh, tubes. And the reason they used the boron aluminum over Inconel or any other, they were stronger than any material that we could find besides those. They were very specially made. They were tremendously strong in the tension and compression uh, part, but they were fragile as can be. You could physically walk up to it right in the middle and take your hand and stick on it and push it, and you would break it. Hmm. What's the size of uh, comparison here? Is this uh, could a person fit inside of there? I don't have a. Uh, the, you would have to hurdle, you know, like hurdles. You'd have to drop, step over the framework, and I would say that's probably two and a half feet at the at the out at the wall. Oh, okay. okay. So it's, it is is it, it's a yard yeah. by yard. Well, it, yeah, they varied in like they varied in spacing. Right, we're gonna see. Yeah, we varied in spacing. Other... Now you can again you see the the two wire trays, and then as you walk up, you'll see a lot of uh, some wiring with the the uh, reddish uh, material on it. Those are thermal sensors that were. This is 102. This is Columbia. So those were all they were stationed. They were placed everywhere in the orbiter, inside the wings and everything. So that's that's some of the, what we could get access to. We would remove the other, but the other ones we just could not. But that is uh, the the framework. Uh, What's the window above there? The window above that, over there to the well to the right. That is uh, a vent door. Mm -hmm. uh, come down a little bit. Uh, they're right there. That is a vent door. So there's a series of about 10 on each there's, side. There's, or yeah, there, there's a vent door for the forward compartment. There's a vent, several vent doors for the fuselage and then mid body rather. And then there's a vent door for in the aft. It's basically has, the shuttle has been divided into three compartments. And what they are want to do is as we launch, and we're going from a 14.7 psi atmosphere to down to, to vacuum what they want to do is control because we have to bleed off all that atmosphere air it's inside the shuttle so they want to con they have to control it there's a computer system that cr opens and closes them so that the, it they equally de um depressurize mm -hmm. we were told that the aft bulkhead if there was a delta pressure between the mid body and the aft of greater than I think one and three quarters psi, the bulkhead would collapse. Whoa! And the wings would fold up. 
So that's how they were very, very concerned about this. Huh. Interesting. And it also, on re-entry, they'd also open and close to re-pressurize the, the, the compartments all equally. Interesting. Now, I get an idea of some workers inside yeah, there's a worker there here. And, and very touchy in there. Marty, does that remind you of working on the lunar module at all? <laughs> some of your electrical uh, days where you were inside the limbs? No, I'm afraid not. I mean, okay. there's a whole lot more wiring, many more compartments than the lunar yeah. module had. Uh -huh. now, that's the, to the left of the picture there, that is the back bulkhead of the crew compartment. Yeah. Okay. And that grayish tube that you see is, is we would, uh, when the doors were closed, we would flow air through that, and that would air wash down from the top of the, from the forward end of the uh, mid-body to the aft, and that is to cool the payloads that are in there uh, when the doors are closed. All right. Well, here's an important part of yes. uh, the doors. Uh, yeah, this is the, the doors are closed. These are what we call strong backs that are put on there. Now, there's a lot of misconception. Some people say the doors were not strong enough to withstand opening, and that's not true. The doors are definitely, they're non-structural part to the shuttle itself. They don't provide any structural rigidity to the shuttle. There are four independent panels per side, and but they do have to be closed for aerodynamics on re-entry. So this limiting factor why we couldn't open the doors in the horizontal is the drive motors for the doors. They were designed to work on orbit and not in 1G environment. They're too small and so we have to assist the doors open uh, using these strong backs. You'll see this hook that's coming up and you, you cannot see the cable but there's a cable that goes up, makes a 90 degree turn through a pulley, goes across the the uh, bridge and there's another 90 degree pulley that it goes down into a, a a cage and in that cage there is weights and what we're doing is the door is as we drive the door open with the motors the weights are pull helping pull the door up they're counteracting the weight of the door so that the motors thinks it's in zero g when it gets to the vertical position it changes and as the doors continue to open then now the weights have to keep the door, support the door, keep it from mm -hmm. ramming down. So that's how that, that system works. It, it's very simple, but it, it works very good. Absolutely. We, we actually have steam programs going on this yeah. month on levers and leverage and stuff like yeah. that, that that's being used yeah. in there. Here it is, the door is open. You can see the, the C hook that's uh, now it's over in a different position, but there is the door completely open in the OPF. We'll point out that the door is two parts. Tell us about that. Well, there is, the door is, 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 is broken into really, it's four separate panels and they're pinned together. And so that they can, uh, do the thermal loading, they can expand and contract. And then we call frizzy is in between the, the panels. If you saw it from when the door is closed to keep the thermal load heat from coming back in. You and have the, radiators inside though, that I'm saying is the second part of there's, it. There's there's four radiators, they're independent. Uh, the, the Ford two can be deployed. Uh, they're twice as thick as the, they're aluminum honeycomb, they're twice as thick as the F2 panels and they radiate from both sides. Mm -hmm. Whereas the F2 radiate just from the top side. Okay, which there's a lot of heat generated. Yes. If the doors aren't open the first orbit, they have to come back because it would overheat. Now, in Apollo, we used the water glycol as the coolant, uh, but it was very corrosive and it would not work in in a vehicle that continues to you know, flies mission after mission. Mm -hmm. It's also very it was very dangerous. Question, Marty. Doug Forrest is asking, how quickly did the doors open in space? You'd have to ask an astronaut that. Uh, uh, it's fairly quick. I mean, they uh, we did it at the pad. In the pad, we can open vertically by just using the motors. But we have to have what we call torque tubes on them to keep the doors from sagging. We'll see that when we ever get to the mm -hmm. pad discussion. But uh, they could open the doors vertically. I don't. I don't have a time frame for for all well, that. It was a ninety minute orbit. They had to get them open before yeah, they're, they're, first they're, orbit, they're fairly so. quick. It's not. It doesn't take 10, very long. Fifteen minutes. But yeah. the radiators for shuttle we use Freon. 
Okay. Okay. All right. Well, we're enjoying a conversation with Gary Allgaier. We got a few more slides to go through, but yeah. stick with us. We're going to show you yeah. a couple of new things that you've never seen before, including a camera way up there at the top of this <laughs> the stabilizer. Yeah. Uh, always love to see the American flag uh, there in the payload bay, but I wouldn't exactly know what these were until Gary told me, and they're a very important part they're, of the space yeah, shuttle. Yeah, it's one of the main... Most important Sacred, thing. Most important thing. These are the three fuel cells that we fly. Fuel cells that provide create electricity, and you get you know take hydrogen and oxygen, and you combine the two, and you get electricity and a byproduct is your water. These are about the same size as the ones that were in the, the Apollo. No, they're module. they're a fraction of the size. The Apollo ones are about the size of a fifty gallon drum. Uh, oh, okay. Well, I don't have anything Apollo. in relationship. Those yeah. are a lot smaller. These are a lot smaller. Yeah. In fact, the next photo you'll see them putting it in. You can see basically in relationship to to a person how small they were, whereas the other ones were 50-gallon drums. You see it right there. Yeah. It's parallel been... to, to me right there, the, the white yeah. cylinder thing there. Yes. Um, and we've had, uh, because one failed, we've had... Uh, shuttles come back early. That's right. Yes. Uh, in fact, the famous uh, refly of 87 and 93 okay. uh, failed uh, and brought it back early. Well, what's this little slinky thing? Now, this, looking? Is, this is uh, the, the RMS, the remote manipulator arm that was designed and built by uh, this company in Canada called SPAR. Mm -hmm. yeah. Marty's got a comment from one of you Stay Curious Watchers. That would be me. Uh, the cargo bay doors took one minute to open and took about two minutes to close. Okay. Did one minute that? to open. Wow, Marty, thank you. Two okay. minutes to yeah. close. Yeah. That's kind of, that's fast. Yeah. Of course, yeah. weightlessness and weightlessness and this small motor. How, what would you say was the, the power the, of those motors? They used 440 volt DC motors. They were about hmm. this long and about that big around, hmm. but they weighed a ton. Wow. Thank you, Marty. That's good to know how yeah. quickly that yeah. that went. All right, we got home stretch here. We're looking yeah. at the arm. You were this in Canada. Is down, this is up oh, in Canada but, in Spar. But yeah, that's a special floor that that's on. Okay, this is this is in Toronto, uh, Canada. The floor is all coat is one is they completely coated this big room with Teflon, and it sit the arm sits on a special rig, and on the legs that are tef, that are sitting on the floor. They have air to them, and they have little pads, and it basically is a reverse air hockey table. Yeah, air hockey table. And this allowed them to run the joints uh, as, as though it was in zero, zero G. And they could run one section if they were going to do one one area, and then if they wanted to do the other, if you know, like my wrist, and then I could do, you know, I could do certain things. They'd have to t take the rig, the, uh, the RMS off, flip, turn it over on the side, and then they would go back and do the testing again. Mm -hmm. And then back in the corner, there was a, a, a mini mock-up of the aft flight deck, uh, and that's where I met Sally Ride. She was the instrumental in the developing the procedures and, really? and software and the testing, for, and uh, she flew it when she was the first female astronaut in there. That's when she operated the arm. What was that experience meeting Sally Ride? It was it was very nice. She was very cordial. Uh, shook her hand, talked to her just a little bit, and I enjoyed it. Very petite lady, right? She was very petite, very very smart. Oh yeah. And uh, uh, she was a very nice lady. Really. She pumped your brain for what you knew. No, she didn't. She was. I, <laughs> you know, they're they're doing procedures, and you don't want to run and interfere with them. So I was invited up there. I didn't know she was there. I just went up oh. and then there she was and bill lenore was the other astronaut there but bill i don't think ever flew but uh we're we're proud to have sally rise handprints and, yeah, and bronze yeah, here at the american yeah. space museum so here's some of your working chums there the gentleman that's uh the cloak to the right of the one that's been over that was his, his name is john clamp and he was the program manager for the arm and he's just showing the person this was is it called the end effector? This is what captures the docking tar uh, target on any payload. And NASA accepted it 11 February yes. 81 for the April 12th. Well, actually, they, they went on STS-1. Yeah. The on STS -2. SPAR, Spar uh, did a, had a pretty cool trick. 
the, you know, a lot of companies bid on this contract. Spar says, if you give the contract to us, we will give you the first arm free. Really? Yes. Huh. So, uh, and they, millions and millions they, of dollars. There. And uh, they, they really, they had their act together. Uh, the Spar, I never heard of Spar, uh, S P A R. Uh, it, and uh, I guess they in did Canada. Canada, and they did a lot of stuff for helicopters and um, gearboxes, hmm. uh, I think, in, in Canada. But uh, they very had good, talented engineers. Most of their engineers, like John right there, he's they're, they're transplanted uh, UK people from hmm. England. Uh huh. That's an unusual picture. Yeah, this there. is the first time. This is Columbia. We're installing the arm for the very first time. The yellow section that you see is called a strong back. That supported the um, uh, arm during transportation. It had some legs on it that we could roll it so we could roll it around the floor, but they have to be removed so we can install it. There's three pedestals that the arm would sit on uh, that would, it has a stowed position so they could close the doors and then they could, astronauts would flip a switch and they would be called deploy, which would swing it outboard. And then there was another switch they could release hooks that were holding the arm uh, in the pedestals and then they could raise and lower the arm as they needed to do their function. Look at all those structures in the, the, the cargo bay yeah. for them to work on those platforms. And so One of the down. interesting things when I went to Toronto and we was going through the final design discussions, the GSE guy that owns the Strongback came into the room and told us that uh, to ship it from Toronto to the Kennedy Space Center he wanted us to survey all the roads that the, that arm would transverse across the United States, and he was going to limit the speed to 15 miles an hour. Oh, wow. And I, I, I told him that was unacceptable. <laughs> and the next meeting he repeated, I said, that's still unacceptable. He says, we are not going to survey our roads. I says, if it can land in a shuttle without a strong back at 210 miles an hour, it can go down the interstate at 50, whatever, six or 60. So they backed off. <laughs> <laughs> well, the kind of discussions people have is just really yeah. amazing yeah. on there. Uh, I see a couple autographed astronauts there, Joe Engel yeah. on the far left. And of course, uh, uh, Truly. Uh, Truly's uh, in there. I'm between the two astronauts. This white is, shirt, white pants. Yeah, there, white okay. pants. And the Nick gentleman next to me is my the Rockwell counterpart. Uh, this was picture was taken about. What was his name? Uh, uh, we call him Shifty. Don, Shifty. Don Schifflanger was Shiflanger, his, his yeah. name. He was a very, very good person to work with. But this was, picture was taken at probably about three thirty, four o'clock in the morning. Uh, we had worked all day trying to get prepped for this. And the time we got to actually put it in, that was what time. And then uh, the astronauts, those are the two astronauts that came down to witness the installation. Because STS-2 Columbia had that on board, yeah. and they, they were the first ones to try yes. it. Well, what a nice keepsake that is. Uh, here's an important part of the shuttle. With, this is Columbia, and when they shipped it to us from Palmdale, it, it was, uh, the, and everybody was wanting to get it to, you know, out of there and launch, you know, bring it to Kennedy. And so it came to us, and it wasn't complete. We had a lot of, a lot of uh, stuff we had to go back and install. And this is the first time we ever installed the leading edge RCC, the reinforced carbon carbon uh, leading edge panels. They were used, you know, because that's the highest temperatures that they see on reentry. And then our, this material was designed to handle that. The nose cap was also made out of RCC. They had a lot of, we had a lot of problems with the install. A lot of the uh, Linkages weren't uh, didn't match up with the with the RCC panels, and so it took, I, I would say probably several months, if, if not maybe almost a half a year, to uh, get those things completely installed. Mm -hmm. and of course, this is the piece that gentleman's holding is like uh, uh, what a piece of the external tank hit and punched a hole in and doomed the Columbia astronauts yes, in right. 2003. Yeah. Uh, but it's an interesting picture there. Uh, I've always, uh, you know, there's no dress code <laughs> there. Well, Jeans and t-shirt and tennis at shoes. At the beginning, we, we there was no dress code. Uh, as we progressed long further into the shuttle program, uh, cleanliness became a requirement. We didn't want to carry up into space when we opened up the pay the bay doors and have a bunch of stuff come floating out. So 
over time, we tightened up to all the dress codes, and especially at the pad. We, we definitely did a lot of work out there to make that room a class 1000 clean room. Mm -hmm. uh, we enlarge that picture there, kind of, yeah. uh, again, unusual now, photo, but it shows an important piece of this hardware. Is, this is the KU band antenna. It's, it's, it stows, and then when we open up the doors, they can bring it out and turn it. And this was the first time that they ever built this type of a unit because it's not only just a radar uh, antenna, it is also communications. So it's all built into one uh, The antenna. black and gold now, there you, in the center. If you remember, and Marty would know this, on the on lunar module, we had two antennas, one dedicated for rendezvous radar and the other one was for communications. Mm -hmm. So for, for the shuttle, they took those two and made them into one. So this is stowed, and when the, the doors are deployed in a minute, this comes out quite yes. quickly, I'm and sure. And that's how they communicated to the ground. <clears throat> and then when they were going to rendezvous with anything, then they also used the same antenna. So what if they go to close the doors and that, that motor breaks and they can't bring it back in? <laughs> they, had an, they, they had an explosive system that would... Is that right? Yeah, pyrotechnics Pyrotechnics would blow it. And it, same thing with the arm. They had pyrotechnics in the pedestals, and if they didn't retract, then they could just go ahead and fire those, and they would just totally eject the uh, Never arm. would have thought of pyrotechnics yeah. on the arm and, and the they antennas. They were very concerned with getting the doors closed. We had... Uh, uh, winch, yeah, winches. I would say that. Yeah, winches, <laughs> yeah, well, now, winches on each side that they could pull. Now, the doors had to be closed. They didn't have to be sealed, so they had a, mech they had a way if the doors failed to close, they could go in there and deep disconnect all the linkages and they could winch them close and then they could tie them together and that would get them back in on a spacewalk on a spacewalk yes huh a lot of contingencies you never thought about yeah. well here's a picture i alluded to probably yeah. no, none of us haven't seen this was added to columbia uh after i don't know several missions and this this is an infrared a spectrometer camera that they wanted to do is on re-entry is to look at the heating loads that came across the shuttle just to see what the patterns were. They also talked about putting a video camera in there but that never really happened mm -hmm. and so because we were kind of excited to be able to see re-entry or see our, on orbit with the camera up there but it, it never happened. Think of the, the 3,000 degree plasma flowing yeah. over that. This just, just kind of shows uh, the two indentations up at the top up there. That's where the star trackers were. They could open those doors on orbit, and then they're using the star tracker to help them for in guidance and aiming the shuttle. For yeah. People had certain, the experimenters had certain attitudes that they wanted to be in or look at a certain area in the, in the, in the sky. And so this helps them got, you know, position the orbiter in the correct position. So there's those two indentions yeah. there, they're covered. They're actually little optical telescopes in yeah. there. Now, uh, what would this Atlantis would be? It doesn't have the windows covered, so. The windows, there's. there's uh, this be configured for flight or just a this test? Is, this is for flight. Terminal. This is a uh, test. The windows, there's three, win three panes per window. There's two in the pressure module. There's two windows there. They're, they're, I, I can't remember exactly how thick they were. I'm going to say they were maybe a half inch thick. And there was a gap between the two panes. And then the outer heat, outer uh, compartment had a much thicker, like a three quarters to a one and three quarter inch window. So, and then between what they did is they put a bellows around them. So, they had to actually they had a set of engineers. That's all they did was worry about the windows and keeping them clean. And th there was a system that uh, allowed the windows. They had desk desiccant containers. So as we went up on orbit, the window, the vacuum, they could vacuum the, uh, the between the windows. There was no pressure there. And on reentry, they repressurized that. My scale. gosh! And they always put had dry drain two on them to keep them so that the astronauts always had a very clear window. Now we're in the OPF or out at the pad, there's covers over them, mm -hmm. but uh, we, and we moved for, for flight. Optical glass. And, too, the, pro and it's, the story too. was if, if they lost the outer window on re-entry, the heat coming in from the thermal, you know, from the re-entry would heat up the frames 
on the inner windows and they would break and then we would lose the crew. Wow. There's a lot of lot of failure modes that uh, uh, that are very very critical. Yeah, who who thinks much about reentry and what those windows are going yes. through, yeah. uh, or went through during the show? Now, the beautiful three the, decade era. The F bulkhead only had two panes because there's you're not inside the the uh, uh, forward fuselage. Gotcha. Okay. And in the VAB, this is the VAB, and then we just we're coming up. And uh, what we had to do, once we rotated vertically, we had to, the cranes had to have a special head on them so that they could rotate the shuttle. And it hit, because the shuttle was too wide to pass through the opening, they would, and then once they were passed through the opening between the towers, then they would rotate it back around and made it with the, the tank. All right. Well, as we're winding up here, yeah. looking at the bird in orbit, the beautiful turnaround yeah. that it does, it did at the International Let's Space see. Station to inspect everything. You can see the body flap uh, at the end of the, and it had two functions. The, uh, when you're getting ready, you know, getting into lower atmosphere and you're subsonic, what they, they had the, the rudder, the tail rudder was split and it was used as, it would open up and that would act as a, as a drag. So, you know, airplanes have flaps. This one here just opened up and they, and, and uh, to slow the, the shuttle speed down. But when it opened, based because it's way at the back end of the shuttle and the moment arm, it would pitch the, arm, the shuttle up, which is what they don't want to have happen. So the body flap was tied into that. So when the, it pitched up, the body flap pitched down. So they kept the shuttle level or a hmm. dangle of uh, on re-entry body flap and, there below the yeah. engines there. and it also protect the engines uh on re-entry from the all the heat getting back up into the the engine so mm -hmm. it had two purposes again the yeah. the turnaround there yeah. those om pods there yeah. like cheeks in the back and yeah. the, the uh spread out there uh, just you can see the radiators shot. there and the forward two radiators were deployable, but uh, I've, like I said, I've never seen a picture where it's been deployed. The crew astronauts did not want to deploy them because that was just another failure mode if they didn't retract because mm -hmm. they right. couldn't because they would interfere with the payloads if it was in the payload bay. And I'm going to ask some of them about that yes. there as we're looking at uh, Discovery orbiting the Earth yeah. there and thanking Doug Forrest for watching and Gary Gerald, Bill Whiting. Tom Musiak, Humberto Villado Lopez is watching. Okay. Ophelia Sotterell, she's in France. Wee oui, wee oui, girl. Mark Usiak's watching. And uh, Marty said it was a little bit chilly in uh, Pennsylvania there for the Usiak brothers. Uh, Tom Celentano, thank you for taking your time on this excellent talk by Gary Allgaier. Mm -hmm. JT, thank you, Jay. And we got, uh, like Marty said, Tram C. Cumbannon. And Steve Hammer, Daniel DeYoung, good to hear Daniel out there. He's an airline pilot. Carlton Bailey. Carlton, good to see you today. Yeah. Carlton may have been out there waiting for that uh, uh, 3D rocket to launch that they scrubbed, uh, scrubbed. Uh, uh, again today. So uh, anyway, you got some of your, one of, when they uh, came time for the STS-1 in 1981, uh, they took everybody out there of the, in groups and took a Group, photo of each, there, each right? section was taken out there this was a, at the time uh, a year section a, I'm, a, at the, I'm a extreme left kneeling all right far left far kneeling left there, yeah. yeah and that's me and then of course there's Selena she was our secretary and the rest of us uh, they all worked various systems uh, I Several of them had, I know have passed away by now, but uh, mm -hmm. uh, that was the group that we had, and they, and we never got to do this in the Apollo program. They didn't have us do that, but no. uh, for the shuttle program, we they brought everybody out by system and had their photographer take a picture of them, and then we would get a copy of it, which was well, nice. The shuttle is about people, just yeah. like Apollo, and and, and and it's people that that built these things. There you are. With your beard, I recognize yeah, you there. Yeah, And uh, that was an astronaut that uh, was going to fly yeah, and unfortunately uh, lost his life to brain cancer. cancer. But the, Who was that? that was that's a, Frank Cadero. He's, Frank he's, Cadero. He was born in Argentina. Um, NASA had made an announcement that, because uh, you know, everybody says, well, how come if you work there, why not you become an astronaut? Well, 
Finally, uh, Houston came out and says, we will t select two people from Kennedy Space to, uh, uh, Space to, uh, Philly to become astronauts. So they selected one from the, from, uh, the shuttle, and they selected another lady from uh, the payload community. And Frank was in our office. He, he started out as a contractor, and he was a main engine expert. Hmm. And uh, he, he ended up uh, going through the selection process, and he won the, the, the selection. And so he left our office, went to Houston for two years for training, and then became an astronaut. And then, unfortunately, before he could be, before he flew, he ended up getting uh, brain cancer and passed away. Oh. Tragic. Yeah. Marty, did you ever run across him? Marty worked on the SSMEs. Yeah. 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 Okay. okay. Uh, thousands of people working out there, of course. Yeah. So, uh, well, Gary, this has been always enlightening to hear what you have to share about uh, the uh, shuttle era there. I think everyone out there is going to agree they learned something about the shuttle yeah. structure and its operations that you never knew before, or even thought about before. Yeah. And uh, anything that you'd like to say to wind up? Well, you know, it was a tremendous change in philosophy and in the way, because we, we had been launching Apollo spacecraft, which was all, you know, vertically processed. And then we came along and we had, nobody knew anything about airplanes. And we, so we had to sit down and figure out how we're going to do this. And we had to start from scratch. We didn't have anybody come and tell us. And so we had to start talking to engineers, talking to other people outside of the, the industry to see what we would do and how we would do it. And then we, uh, once we did the OPF, then we had to go learn how to do it vertically because we would install payloads vertically. And that is a whole other set of equations to, to, to do that. It's not as simple as it was to put them in horizontally. So. Right, yes, the pigums involved in that. We, that was we've a, got a replication of the yes, payload uh, a, integration something. Yeah, if you come to the this space museum, you will find uh, we have a very good model of the pigum and how it works. And it's a very, very complex system. At a minimum, it takes 40 people to run it. Wow, yeah. Well, and we'll talk take, about that as yeah, a featured show. It'll be one another day, feature though. show. Well, Gary, thank you so much for thank spending you for your time me. researching stuff. We really enjoy him. He's a docent here, and uh, people enjoy his, these type of stories from other docents here at our American Space Museum that worked on the shuttle era. So check that out. So, uh, Marty, we everything uh, okay on our Streamlabs production there? Yeah, we're looking good. Well, thank you, my friend. Tomorrow we're going to have Terry White, the... Uh, Orbital garage mechanic, so to speak, manager of those garages. We'll talk. Uh, we're going to talk, Gary, about the real first return yeah. to flight, STS-2, and what it took to take Columbia uh, after its first flight in April and relaunch it in November right. 1981. And Terry White's going to tell us all about that, and you're going to learn some things like I'm excited to learn uh, about our fabulous shuttle era that in three decades changed the way our whole society operates. I'm absolutely convinced of that. And our beautiful uh, International Space Station, Gary, now has 11 occupants on it. And you had the three human beings from China orbiting their space station. And we've tied again the record number of people orbiting Earth at this moment uh, is 14. Uh, wow. On uh, March uh, 8th, 2020, I think this is the fourth time we've had 14 people in yes. space. So uh, looking forward to breaking that one day. Uh, and we know we will soon with the way the private companies are coming on board. So, well, thanks again, everyone, for a wonderful show. And uh, everybody watching, stay curious. Tell your friends to watch our handlebar friend, Terry. Uh, <laughs> Uh, tomorrow on Stay Curious. Until then, I'm Mark Marquez saying thank you for bridging the space between us.